can see I was unaware If the love was certain I couldn't keep, I couldn't bear To see you with her hurting I let it cost all of my wants Cause a smile was worth it And now you see that I've been there Since the day you walked in Tell me something, baby I ain't got no questions left Monday, everybody. Uh, Yay. If, you, if you're just joining us from the Justin R. Young stream, hello. Uh, we're about to do the Weird Things podcast with Justin, as well as uh, Andrew, who we got here, and Brian, who you know, just walked in the building. Uh, it's a show about science and uh, the paranormal and a lot of sp- space. You know, talk about space. Futurism. I'd say future. We lean heavily in futurism now. Yeah, the future. The, the thing that the paranormal stuff was like, we kind of talked it out. You mm-hmm. know, like, because I was like, how many more episodes can we do on Bigfoot? You know, <laughs> we were like, yeah, it's cool. It's I cool. mean, just, yes, yes, yeah. me, we can do, we can, we can do, we can do goblins and snakes all day. What? Yeah, even then they just follow that pattern. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you gotta play the hits. toilet snake, Africa oh. goblin. <laughs> See, I I think a toilet snake is like a fundamental like human fear. I think that's why it's a story that never gets old. We're always worried uh, about something in the toilet. Amen to that. <laughs> uh, but hello, hello everybody. July twentieth, twenty twenty. We're gonna start weird things. Here. What about what about Sax Squatch? I haven't heard of him. Is he like the, the like the saxophone guy that bursts out of the forest, but it's Sasquatch playing the saxophone? Oh no, that that's a awesome. uh, that's a guy on Instagram. Yeah. Um. He like this is up. Oh and... yeah, I've seen this. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, that's right. He's like an Instagram guy or something. Instagram? Yeah. yeah, I think that's his Instagram handle. Sax. No, I'm saying maybe he's just showing up and capturing Sasquatch. Oh. Like Sasquatch has found his occupation. And it's yeah. being enslaved by a man with an with a phone. <laughs> no, I just used to be, you know, he just shows up and like, you know, he's microdosing out there in the forest one day and discovered he really liked, you know, EDM or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? We can. Hi, Jace. Can you hear us? Uh, good. I, I'm hearing uh, Andrew on an echo. Uh, oh, here, I <laughs> me? He on an echo? I don't know why. Yeah. It was in your head. <laughs> uh, all right. There we go. Now it sounds yeah. good. Uh, all right. Here. Let me uh, hit that. Quick sure. Before sure, we... sure. Sure. Uh, uh, Andrew, uh, there's a there's a show that I, I um, am tr- just about finished watching that I I wonder if if it would be interesting to you called uh, uh Japan Sinks 2020. It's an you talked about that before. Um, oh yeah, and it's a cartoon, right? It's yeah, it's an it's an anim it's an anime on Netflix. Yeah, we talked at the point actually that there had been a live action version of Roger Corman right. like adapted and stuff. Right, that was right. a pick you did before. Um, I, I mean, I'd be curious to to check it out. I, I have a. 
It's interesting because I, 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 I'm watching it and uh, I like I could feel my Andrew sense tingling of just like, oh, this <laughs> character is really useful. Uh, I wonder how long they're going to stick around. And then, <laughs> and then, oh, you know. boy. Uh, yeah. So like some weird, like predictable stuff like that. Hey, Brian. Yo. So uh, you know, I, we're certain that it's called Japan Sinks and not the Mel Brooks classic Life Stinks. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Man sinks twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, there's there's that thing. Once you once you sort of see through the curtain, kind of, it's not you just yeah. sort of and it's not a thing that, like it certainly happens when you start writing you do that. And also when you see a ton of stuff, you start to you also see why like why film critics who have to consume so much stuff tend to be very jaded and stuff. But because, that's like when they, you see they, stuff they like like they they know like uh let me guess uh she's in the back of the auditorium you know like 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 yeah, there's there's so many of the tricks that that you've seen so many times yeah your pattern detection just becomes so and that's why what it's, it's it's delightful to be surprised that's when it's delightful when like like the strength of let's say Dan Harmon is that Dan Harmon knows all the patterns and then he will shift he'll trade up the pattern except for he's not if he's unaware but there are Dan Harmon patterns to things where you're like. Well, we're supposed to think this. He will then go, you know, orthodox, whatever, to this angle too. But that's it's still great though. That's the thing that's neat is when you see filmmakers who it's one of the reasons like uh some of the best forms of art have come from people that started working in parody. You know, the most successful disco song at the time was like, you know, Heart of Glass by Blondie, and they were parodying disco. You know, the Beastie Boys, you know, were punked and said, Oh, let's kind of let's just sort of parody this. And so you find a lot of examples of like really great writers or creators. Oh, I know this. I can like Lonely Island. Their music videos are incredible because they got the entire genre. And so, and it's sometimes why comedian, like really good comedy directors, can do really good action movies and stuff because they're so used to going. This is the obvious joke. We need to do the different thing. And they're like, oh, this is the obvious way somebody to handle this fight scene. Let's do this thing. Mm -hmm. So, just in the creative process, you're used to going. First thing comes to me, great, throw it out because that's what everybody else would do. Now let's think of the you know eighth thing. Yeah. Um, but more than being kind of some predictable with, with some of its twists and turns, like I'm just key, I keep being shocked by how like brutal it is. Like, I think it does a good job of like having high stakes and having them be very abrupt instead of like, mm -hmm. Ooh, who's what's going to like, like, it's just, it just, that stuff hits you. And, it, and that's really cool. I definitely uh, shouted out loud I'll check it out. watching it today. Yeah. I'll check that. That's like. Favorite moment ever was like that Battlestar Galactica, like into season one or season two, where they do the jump to like two years later. Oh, five years yeah. later, yeah. I, where where, where it's just so it's just, and you just see, uh, you just see a hungover President Gaius Baltar, yeah, with his harem around him, and it's just like, oh wow, you went there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just. Because that's the thing, like, like so many second seasons and stuff suck because they're like, well, let's drag out this point that I didn't quite make in the first season. And we're going to go back. I was like walking like that. I lose more. I get off more shows in the second season because they do like Walking Dead and whatever. But mm -hmm. that jump forward, I just love. They're like, no, we got a lot of story to tell. We got to cover some ground here. How are you doing, yeah. Brian? Uh, good. Good. Yeah. Good weekend. Uh, it was. I, uh, I, I, I wish I had gotten better sleep last night for whatever reason. It was an off night, and uh, and then and then it's one of those things where it's like uh, you realized how privileged you are uh, with your sleep status when <laughs> when the gripe you get from your pebble is groggy. You only slept six hours and fifty two minutes, <laughs> which is thirty percent down from the ten hours you usually sleep. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> it's like all right the, uh, if i slept 10 hours my girlfriend would call the hospital and have to take hours in a coma <laughs> the, uh, I, the, the, I think i'm a five guy you're five hours uh, yeah about five um, yeah i will do yeah usually down around 10 30 or 11 and up around 5 30 5 50 something like that I'll do the thing so, where I fall asleep on the couch and then wake up at four or five a.m. and then go back to sleep for another four hours or something. Oh, <laughs> mom sleep. <laughs> it's my dad's. That's exact. It's how my dad sleeps. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, that's that's probably more accurate for for what I'm up to. 
Uh, like, like, like there's always some kind of like middle, you know, like uh, uh, the midnight snacking is real. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the power went out at my neighborhood at 1 a.m., which is usually when I'm still awake. And so that was that was wild. Just the like the whole block went out, everything. And then you heard the bang of uh, uh, I think Dark Redeemer in the chat in the discord was said it was uh, probably a transformer that blew. Uh, but you hear it after all the power goes out because of sound, because it takes sound. A lot of people running into yeah. units and stuff. Because fire just... comes at you when you're in space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fire comes at you. It might be AC. Like we have like a really bad. We get power, little power, um, little brownouts a lot. Um, Good yeah. news is you're getting a new transformer in your neighborhood. And I get little brownouts <laughs> every single day. Uh, Damn, that's poop. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it is poop, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but it was weird because it was it was it was one a.m. All the lights were out, and I'm normally up for another hour or so. So I just had to like I don't know. It was very creepy. Hey, when you're in pitch black, it's it's just always going to be creepy. Um, yeah. And so I went to bed early. Um, got good sleep actually. So. Well, that's good. Uh, how's everybody doing? Are we, are we live? We are live. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is all on the record, like like thousands of years and from now, people are gonna say to this pooping. is the conversation. I didn't admit to pooping. <laughs> no, I. Well, and, uh, who knows if Brian was? I just yelled poop. Uh, uh no, I. It, we just had a very a very relaxed energy, which is good, right? You want to have a relaxed energy. <laughs> yeah, but I just didn't shot. know whether or not we were live or not. <laughs> Um, everybody ready to do the show? You guys want to do the show? Yeah. I'm ready to roll, I think we should. Son. Now, I know that it's unpopular, but but I say we have a show. Okay. All right, then I'll count yes. you. Yes. Whoa. Justin, your, your auto happened. game like, kicked way up or something. Yeah. Really? He became a Radio Your's Lab really episode ready. for a second. Uh, um, well, that's fine now, I guess, but... Okay. I mean, yeah, I guess. I, I got... Got no clue what happened there. I can turn myself down a little bit if I'm hot. No, you're you're not hot. It's just the, just, I don't know why it kicked in so quickly like that. Um, but no. Yeah, that's weird because it's only it's it's on Comrex, right? Does Comrex even do auto stuff? Um, no, Comrex itself doesn't. But if it might, I don't know. You usually, in my experience, it's it takes a long time of saying nothing for it to kick up the auto gain um why i did that yeah i mean um okay well yeah we, i have no auto gain on this side well we're, we're we're then we're looking good all right i'll count you in andrew in three two one hello and welcome to the weird things podcast i'm andrew mean joined by brian brushwood hello mr justin robert young hello friends how are we doing Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. That's me. We probably should have answered your question just then. Like, you you posed a direct question of how we're doing, and then we all just stared it at was, you uh, like, like, it like, was, like, it was rhetorical. <laughs> okay. It was rhetorical. And I, I imagine I, I'm everybody doing, listening I'm doing answer well. to themselves. Yeah. 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 Well, good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Andrew, how are you doing? Well, to your statement that it's rhetorical, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to answer that question on the grounds I may incriminate myself. <laughs> so uh, I, I want a show of hands here. Um, who has had a haircut since the pandemic started? Well, gone to a barber shop. Or I, 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 done yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna need. Yeah, I'm gonna need. Uh, I'm gonna need a clarification. I've, uh, I, I have full uh, on not gotten a single hair trimmed by any human. I mean, except for my facial hair, uh, which which yeah. I I feel comfortable doing myself. Uh, but but no, I'm 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 enjoying uh, uh, going back to the 1970s. Like like like. Years from now, we'll be able to look at photos from this time, and it'll be like, "Oh, that those were the COVID days. The fashion <laughs> was to just let your hair grow because you couldn't go to a barber." Uh, yeah, I have not gone to a professional, but 
uh, at a certain point, my my wife, who is trying to level up her quarantine wife skill set, had gotten bored with making sourdough bread and had turned to the next thing on quarantine wife checklist, which was uh, to cut her husband's hair. And that was the give back for her letting me go to Tulsa to cover the politics stuff. So that's what I got my my only haircut. I've uh, I've got a shaver set, so I I have touched it up, my, touched my hair up myself, and I I got a shaver, so I do my do my facial hair and all, but I have not gone to a professional uh, since certainly since before the pandemic started. I might yeah, I, I might a, go I full a, mullet, like uh, like even even when uh, like it's been the the mullet has been a punchline for over twenty years now, which means it's probably due to come back. So when I do get a haircut, I might I might full on mullet up. I mean, I, you I, could make an argument that the mullet was kind of coming back uh, uh, to begin with. Sorry, Andrew, I stepped on you. Oh, no worries. It's the delay. I I was just going to say that, like, I I saw I did I had a Skype call with somebody who had a haircut, like clear on haircut, and I'm like, I was started to feel like, who who are you? Like, what 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 have you been doing? Have you been sneaking out, getting you know? I was like that ready to like just turn somebody in, which is not a good instinct. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah 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 yeah. wow uh so i suddenly realized like like haircuts are now a political statement how weird is that like like uh if 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 somebody you know just you know full-on shaves their head then it's safe to say that they probably did it by themselves at home but if somebody goes and gets professionally quaffed then you know in this mask no mask red blue uh, duopoly it's uh uh it's probably a statement but it's like if you wear no mask you're like no no i had it i'm clear i have the antibodies and then if you have a professionally done haircut like no i live with a hairstylist no really it's fine <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. We, need to, we need to see a certificate and some proof of this yeah that's it well one gentleman said hey i'm not gonna deal with this enough is enough and have you seen the video of the quarantine haircut robot? No. Is it a Floby? So, oh, no, Brian. It's better. So say you're a roboticist and you're like, hey, I build robots. And uh, we'll get into one of the sort of the general problems with robotics in a moment. But this guy's like, I got a solution. I'm going to build myself a quarantine robot haircut machine. Oh, my gosh. And you see the image and it looks like somebody made their own version of Saw. It Ooh, does look like up. somebody is about to be murdered. <laughs> ah, ah, describe this. Describe this to ah, everybody. So oh he's, my god! He's, he's popped up through like a little, uh, like a little porthole. Like he's he's on display as one of the heads from Futurama. It, no, no, this exactly. Yeah, this is like if you were doing a bit on the Jetsons. He was yeah, where he was like. Uh, being served as dinner at some macabre uh, uh, dinner party. His head is like popped up as if it were like going to be revealed by a big silver dome or something. Also, it, 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 is, it, it, it is weird. It also looks like he's about to write a song with the refrain, two, two turntables and a microphone. Like, uh, yeah, like Beck. he has a very, but, yeah, very late nineties Beck kind of, kind of vibe. But, he, if you told me this guy built a robot to cut his hair, I'd believe you. There's something about just the, the face, the look. I'm like, yes, I believe this band is capable of doing a competent job of that. So we're watching the time and... lapse of him him doing it. So I guess this looks like kind of the vacuum uh, haircut device well, a little bit. But... It's so it's it's an armature that rotates around where his head goes through so it can rotate around there. And there's a little machine to cut it. He's used computer vision to figure out where his head is. So it's basically the computer's trying to figure out where his head is in, in three-dimensional space, and it goes in and it uses a thing that looks not unlike some sort of chomper. <laughs> well, the and best part is his facial expression is constantly surprised and confused. <laughs> like, like the entire video along. I mean, what else, He's the what one... else would you look like? Wait, like he, a robot he, with the scissors He's the by one. Face. He's the one who built the damn thing. You would think that yeah, he would not be surprised. Dude, <laughs> this poor dude is alone in his garage <laughs> thinking, uh, yeah. is, is my landlord going to come in here and find my decapitated head? And they're gonna go. No, must have been a suicide. 
Brian, I can only imagine what you believe the face of the Wright brothers were as they took off. Like, you know, I'm sure it wasn't like a confident pirate sailing through the sky. It was like they probably looked like they're about to poop themselves, which is what this guy looks like. Fair enough. Fair so enough. the way it works is really clever. He uses you know, a vacuum to pull up the hair and then actual scissors, not not a buzzer, like little scissors come in, cutting, snip, 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 snip away, much like a stylist pulling on your hair, cutting. It's really, this is not a flow beat. This is actually doing a very, you know, so from a good starting point cut. It's using actual, it's at barber scissors to cut his hair, what, which makes it more ter ter terrifying. Uh, wh which I suppose means that uh, whatever software runs it, like you could full on select a a particular haircut and see a simulation of what it will look like before you even begin. Yeah, I I think like there's this is amusing. If I I think that upper end hairstyling is always going to be have a place or always going to be people who want to go in there and get a haircut from like you know a person talking to them and stuff. But for like people like me who are, if I can just stick my head in a box and pull it out like five minutes later and have a haircut, done. It is my least favorite activity that I have to do on a regular basis. Get uh, going get, to get, get a haircut. haircut. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, man, that's crazy. I, I, I mean, it doesn't look terrible. Uh, uh he was, he's, I guess we're watching the video now bullet. and it's silent. So he's he's yeah, explaining it, that uh, some of the issues are that it couldn't get close to his ears or I guess to the hairline at the back of his uh, of his head. So he's got a little bit of a mullet and some chops, um, but those are relatively easy enough to. I mean that's a that's a up. fine haircut. Like uh, uh, if if he with a straight face said this is this is my favorite haircut, I I think I'd believe him. Uh, uh yeah no credit to this dude this dude man living the dream uh a uh, robot uh, haircut and and didn't get stabbed in the face or eyeball with a robot scissor so this is uh shane whiten uh his youtube channel is stuff uh, stuff made here and he's done other really cool stuff too he's he's a really capable builder there's some people you watch them build stuff and you're like um Okay, and you watch this guy. Some of his builds, I think, are really, really smart stuff. He's a guy that knows what he's doing. So, uh, uh, stuff yeah, made no. here. Shane Whiten. Yeah, I don't know. If, uh, uh, I, think, I, think, I, I think I'm too into the idea of just growing my hair out right now. Like, uh, just because I, I, in my lifetime, I don't think I'll have another opportunity to like this to do so. <laughs> maybe, maybe get uh, a perm. Now, Justin didn't. Yeah. Am I remembering right? Didn't you go to a robotic uh, barber a few months ago in Oakland? Or wasn't there one in, like near you that you made a whole thing of like going to go? Or do? was it a robotic yeah. arborist? Like what? a, yeah, I swear you were going to try to. I agree. There was, there was something about that. Somebody had some sort of like robot something. We're totally. Are Mandela you guys gaslighting effect. me? Like, what no, the hell no, are you talking no, about? No, 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 no. Uh, that was a legit I said thing. That I, was I am gaslighting. These these other two this, seem to think this guy, they're oh, talking. He would. Something. He would uh, buzz up your. He yes, would buzz up your this. edges. Oh yes, 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 yes. Okay, I remember us talking about it. Uh, th there was never any serious uh, 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 thought to you, to doing it. Though. You were gaslighting us. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and yeah. besides, this is All just right. a dude. Like he wasn't offering, was he? <laughs> like I think, I think he, he was. I was just like, I think. Oh, uh, was he? I think so. Because, man, oh. Justin, like, way to turn on your friends here. You're like, oh, you're, oh, I was never gonna do that. Oh, it's real. But no, he wasn't offering it. No, he's charging six dollars a neck cut. I, I don't have six dollars. It's all in Bitcoin. Yeah. This, oh, was, this was seven months ago. So um, you know how we could get six dollars is if people headed on over to patreon.com slash weird things and supported this little show. Absolutely. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you can give me money to get my uh, uh, haircut that I'm definitely going to get now. And I'm currently neck, making neck, a real big deal about it. Just my <laughs> neck fuzz, though. That's it. Nothing else. Uh, no, Patreon.com well, slash wait, weird wait. things. This is. The other guy, that was a problem. His didn't do the neckline. This oh, the two of yeah. these guys got to get together. Good. Yeah. This is why you need to bring these geniuses. Yeah. Got to bring the genius together. 
Uh, yeah, so there we go. Uh, 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 check it out. I've been saying this on all the Patreon reads lately. The best thing about Patreon is you get the custom RSS feed at any level. You're giving any amount of money, you're getting that custom RSS feed. You put it in your pod catcher, and you're just going to get these episodes just a little bit earlier. It just it, The way that it works is, you know, a, a, a Patreon just updates a lot faster than some of these other directories. It is worth it. Go get it. Patreon.com slash weird things. Yeah. I thought we'd do another robot story because there was something that came, announcement that came out last week about a new consumer or, you know, all-purpose sort of robot. And again, you know, that's, those are the things that we think about, oh, the future, we're going to see robots. You know, that's going to be thing that's going to come out. And robots are kind of complicated because one, one of the challenges of robotics is that we're often trying to build robots that look like people when a lot of the tasks that people used to do, now we have more complicated machines do them. Right. So it's kind of like we're building things. This would be great in the 19th century, you know, here, but there are a lot of edge cases where they look at. Here's a cool robot. If you go to the website is hello-robot.com. And what they've built is this sort of, it's just, it's, looks like almost like an IV stand kind of thing. It's a big, tall stand, and it has an arm that moves up and down. And the advantage of this is that it's able to sort of, it doesn't look like a human, but it looks like you know, clearly a machine. It looks like something out of Star Wars. Imagine a stuff. Roomba with a, uh, with a broom on top and, and, and an arm that is on the broom, right? And the arm extends out. That's the key thing. Is this arm can extend several feet out beyond. So we're watching the thing vacuum a couch right now. We watched it pick up like a dog's toy. And because that arm extends all the way out and back, it can go across counters. It can open up cabinets. Oh, it can wow. reach inside. We're going to watch it pull laundry out. Now, uh, what, was the, uh, what was the bot that was supposed to just watch you do things and then copy you? I, man, that must have been like uh, uh, five years ago. Um. Yeah, there, yeah, there have been some, like, that's one of the things they try to do is do that. Now we're watching this thing right on the wall, you know, with, and with precision. Ah, so it's like and, a tighter to toddler. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah, see, yeah, exactly. Help me. <laughs> uh, so it's got this big, tall pole. It's got a camera mounted to that, and it's got the arm that just slides up and down and then goes backwards and forwards. It's better just to go look at the video from Hello Robot, but... You're watching the thing do a lot of precise tasks, open drawers, you know, reach into spaces and things. But, but and uh, it's got the the trick and the immediate question that I have is is the training of it because I I I totally believe that all of this could be programmed and arranged to do these things, but I uh, I I I wonder I wonder how easy it is to just say, "Hey, clean this room. Just tidy everything up." Well, that's a big part of what they're working on. That's the big thing. You know, one step one is like you say, have the hardware, but then how do you get the hardware to do it? And they showed, you know, some of the video of an autonomous mode. And the goal is to be able to give things tasks to be able to solve and let it figure out how to do that. And that's where, you know, we're getting to that part where that's that's the much bigger problem. But things are they're getting very, very smart at solving problems and how to do this. We've seen this before with uh, you know, different uh AI companies building AI to play video games and to sort of solve, do problem solving. Yeah. And I, th I think this is, a, like, you know, kind of scaling that. So, so, so right now I'm looking around our studio and I, uh, five years ago, I would describe it as a, a nightmare for AI because we have a bunch of uh, wires just laying out all over the place. We have uh, three different um, throw rugs. We've got, uh, 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 you know, various objects on tables. Um, but now in a world of machine learning, uh, I, I think I believe that you could give it general instructions, like maybe just start with straighten up as an instruction. And then basically it looks at all of the cables and says, well, that is a not straight cable. Let me straighten it up. And then now that it is straight, let me apply a little bit of of sticky tape to make every cable straight. And so maybe, maybe it's not the way you would do it, but when the following day you would walk in and all of the wires would be straight. And then 
you could do another one where it's like um remove dust and then uh uh yeah. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. This yeah. doesn't seem so far away from, from r sincerely practical at this point. And that's what we're looking at right now is they're showing how it enters a room and it starts to scan the room in 3D. And so it builds an entire map of the room, a 3D map of it, and that's how it navigates around. And then it can do things like, oh, it identified this as a coffee table surface. And now you know, it, it figures out how to map. It's going to go pick up the remote control and because it looks over and sees this. Yeah, well, and, I and uh, uh, yeah, even if it's just straighten things up, like uh, like I could imagine going to bed at night and waking up and the mishmash of of uh, for example, I have a bunch of soda cans on here. Um, uh, it's probably not a big deal for it to evaluate uh, full or half full. If it's half full, then you know, uh, take it over to the sink, pour it out, throw it away. Uh, and if it's if it's empty, throw it away. If it's full, uh, set it in the corner in an aesthetically pleasing format. Yeah, yeah. You know, get me a beer. Uh, yeah. Although that one, that one, it's like, uh, I don't know. You know, it's gonna take forever, and it'll probably be the wrong. You know, like I said, an IPA. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. But it is it is a neat sort of step. And part of what's cool about this thing is they make a big deal about how easy it is to move this robot around because I think weight wise, um, I don't remember exactly what it weighs, but it's not, you know, several hundreds of pounds. And this is the thing that you can move in and out. And we've seen that before. Like oh, wow. there was an example of oh, 50 yeah, it only pounds. it yeah. only weighs fifty pounds. That's insane. Uh yeah. That's I mean, I'll tell you that. I think the the what you were the way you set this up is is really the kind of key, which is we're 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 looking for the the form of what will be the most like functional and not necessarily Rosie the robot. And and as we get more, uh, uh, you know, into the future of cementing what this like class of device is going to be and how it's going to interact with our lives, that's going to be part of it is figuring out. Well, all right. Like, what do we, what do we expect from it aesthetically? What do we expect from it functionally? And this is certainly on the other side of like, hey, look, this isn't going to look like something. You know, it's not going to be as aesthetically pleasing as even a Roomba. But if it actually like does everything that it seems like it can do, you're not going to care. You're gonna. It, it's going to be a status symbol that it looks so, like something different. Well, and, and now that I think about it, like we're not even going to need to teach it anything because most likely what will happen is we will set up the like, like, uh, uh, step one, set up the room, however you want it to be. If you want it to be clean and swept, then have it be cleaned and swept. Uh, if you want, you know, what, if, uh, whatever, everything being perfectly organized on your coffee table should look like make it look that way. You know, if, if, if you want cables arranged a certain way, arrange cables in that certain way. And then just overnight, it's going to go around and, and, and remember that picture of, of, well, everything needs to be, it's, it's going to be the perfect OCD bot where it's just going to say like, uh, well, that's not where that's supposed to be. And then just uh, fuss all night long. Yeah. And that's part of too, as you think about, you know, when you start moving more towards the Internet of Things, the idea that let's say you have a smart washing machine and this just needs to know uh, darks from light colored and separate them. And it knows to put them into different things. And then in the smart washing machine, it knows, oh, I'm ready. To, the door is closed. I know it's time to start. Are they all connected? And I think that's one of the things you're going to see is a lot of individual intelligent device, an intelligent fridge, an intelligent microwave, et cetera. And then a robot that sort of can connect between them all. Yeah, and, and, and now that I'm thinking about it, uh, looking at the studio, <laughs> like uh, I, I could imagine walking and leaving. Uh, uh, let's say the uh, the the X32 board is still running, and and it'll be all like, well, these lights shouldn't be on; these should be turned off. <laughs> touch, 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 oh. touch. This is supposed to be shut down through this procedure, and so on. That's crazy. Yeah, I could see it while we're doing a show, just sitting there running the board. Uh oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't see a providing cutting commentary and the perfect <laughs> amount of snark. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we've already seen uh, OpenAI's GPT-3, how it could replace us in what we talk about. So, you know. Oh, God. We're, yeah. We're on, yeah. We're on the way it's a, out, it's, boys. It's, it's going to be a robot of the switchboard, just three different algorithms generating the show. And. I mean, just we're just dinosaurs looking up at that bright dot in the sky and wondering why it keeps getting bigger. It's it's so funny yeah. because like like we have enough content that we could feed into OpenAI, you know, ten years of our program, uh, and then the next step I think in my mind is oh that'd be fun to have it auto generate an episode of weird things and then we could act it out. And then the next thought I have is why would we do that when there's other artificially intelligent programs that will just speak for us in our actual voices. Like, uh, uh, I, I, like, like we're, we're going to get defeated by within five years, we're going to get defeated by a Turing test of, Hey, is this an episode of weird things you actually did or, or not? And we won't <laughs> know. <laughs> We, we can't even remember our own episodes now, so yes. it's not that <laughs> oh, well, I'm setting a very low bar I was going to say, yeah, look, my, 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 my thicket of neck fuzz says that uh, we are not good at remembering anything. So I have a plan for when we've decided to just, like, turn on the robot versions of ourselves to go do our jobs. Mm -hmm. What if we just get some really luxury van campers and go cross country, staying at different, really nice, high end trailer parks. Uh, okay, it sounds awesome. There's a company called Kibbo, K I B B O, which is basically that's their plan. Is the idea that you you pay like uh, they're charging you starting memberships now. You pay like a thousand bucks a month, and basically you get a number of different of these. They call them, I think, uh, exclusive RV parks. You know kitchen supplies, gyms, recreation stuff, all that. And then if you want, you can rent one of their, like the, one of their the sprinters, you know, those are kind of the really nice fans. And, um, so it's kind of a neat idea because if you want to have that kind of, you know, wanderlust sort of lifestyle, but to sort of do it in a way that's, you know, a little more, uh, well, uh, uh, I say. and not only are uh, 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 the wanderlust lifestyle makes it sound like you know that's that's for retirees or so on. Uh, I, I've seen an awful lot of of traction among young millennials who are doing it as a just a cost effects uh, cost effective measure to you know so that well, they that's can exactly bank. how I see it. I, yeah, I think wander. I don't like. I think old people are sort of sitting around, you know, waiting for you know the next episode of you know Downton Abbey. I'm thinking like, yeah, Dang. no, young, you're young, you're, you can be super mobile. We have a lot of people now doing you know remote commuting, etc. So yeah, I mean, I, I two of our friends uh, built their own sprinter van. So the idea that you would be able to, uh, you know, just rent one or, or have those options. Like, I think that that's just a natural progression. Like that just, that, that makes as much sense to me as Airbnb did. Yeah. The Go only, take a look at the, the only thing I think com, is, by the way. Uh, yeah. The only thing that I think is crazy is when they're showing a whole family in a car because no, 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 that's uh that, that is uh that's that's a well, we're not luxury. We're seeing that on their website. We're we're seeing all adults doing this right now. Uh, oh, with the very first episode, or picture has 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 a family hanging out, and no, I'm just they're like, all, they're all grown ups. They're all grown ups. Very tiny grown ups. Yeah, yeah they're small. One's sitting, Brian. Mm. They're sitting. <laughs> all right. Well. No, yeah, it definitely looks like a camping trip. Like this is a, a group of five people that are going on a camping trip somewhere that are out in, in the wilderness. But when you have the ability to, uh, A, just have a little bit more room, uh, then it, it just makes the trip easier. And I mean, in terms of five people, it's hard to sleep inside the Sprinter, I would say. Um, that's a little crowded. But certainly if you're out camping and, you know, you, you know, put a 10 out or whatever, like that, that's I mean, heck, very man, feasible. Just get, just get five of those. Everybody have them all, uh, uh, robotically, you know, chain up together and, and, <laughs> and, uh, no, I like, I like this idea that we do like a wacky races, uh, a cannonball run and in, in sprinter vans that, uh, you know, uh, ends in periodic clamping. 
<laughs> so they're having locations in Ojai, Zion, Black Rock Desert, Big Sur, and you know, basically, it's going to you know, obviously, a West Coast kind of thing for now. At the campgrounds, they have Wi-Fi, uh, fresh facilities, which I guess maybe bathrooms and showers, laundry, a cozy common spaces, you know, full kitchen, stock refrigerator, and pantry, and other sites of gear. So it's kind of like an outfitter sort of thing too. Yeah. So that's the idea is that you, this is like a lifestyle uh, thing where, where now you can go like you, you, you are always going to be in the position to stop at a place and, we, you know, kind of get things let me, done. Can I read the, let me read their pitch. Let uh, me read their pitch for a second. Sure. Kibbo is a new way to live and work wherever you want without giving up relationships or the comforts of home. For less than the cost of living in a studio apartment, we could, in, in, well, in, let's talk about where that is. Yeah. We give you a top of the line sprinter van, a network of home bases across the West, essential groceries and provisions, Wi Fi, an inclusive adventurous community. There you go. Everything you need to live an extraordinary life. Don't shelter in place, shelter any place. Brian, go. Well, we, we, we talked about, uh, we, we mused about what it would be like to live <clears throat> in a, in a, uh, a, a more urbanized uh, version of the same thing where it's like you had a room that, uh, that everything was always custom configured. Like um, because every piece of art on the wall was e ink, it could be all of your posters uh, because, uh, uh, because they were modular, they could physically move. Like, like maybe you didn't know where your room was. You just followed the line to get there. And then when you got there, Maybe it was the same physical room you slept in last night. Maybe it wasn't, but it didn't matter because, you know, the, the closet with all your personal effects uh, was shuttled from one place to another. It, this is kind of shockingly close to that, where, only, only with, um, you know, a, a, a diesel run engines. Um, yeah, it, it's, I don't. The appeal, it sounds neat at first, but then you're like, oh, I'm going to spend the next two years living in a van and sharing picnic tables, which for some people is like, yes, sign me up. Right. Where I, I kind of like the idea of like, I, I would rather have the, the, the much larger sort of a uh, micro house or whatever, you know, and move, go from place to place like that. So here's the deal. All right. Basic membership. $189 a month. And that I assume just makes you, uh, gets you a merit badge or something like that. Uh, full-time clubhouse access. So now I guess you are able to eat and, and uh, drink and stay. That's a thousand. And if you uh, want a van, it is 1500 a month, which I will say in the areas that they are pitching this to, which are largely largely LA and the Bay Area, like if you are willing to say I don't live in an apartment, um, that's not terrible. I don't yeah. know. Fifteen hundred a month gets you a, a three bedroom, two bathroom in Austin, one of the hottest real estate markets in the country. I mean, but that's not where these are. That's and it doesn't get you much in Oakland. Doesn't get you much in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't get you much in L.A. I mean, depending on where you want to live in L.A. Yeah. Uh, you know. So, uh, yeah. I mean, for what they're selling, for the places that they're selling it, like, uh, I, I don't know. It looks competitive to me. I mean, uh, and and keep in mind, I am genuinely a fan of of. The weirder, the better. Uh, uh, everybody try everything. Uh, but, but man, would this not be a good fit for me and the five people in my family? And I don't. I, yeah, I don't the, think this the is for seven you. more right. people in my extended business family. <laughs> you know? Here's here's what. No, I, I, I think that you have definitely uh, uh, you have definitely successfully identified this as a not Brian idea. Uh, <laughs> but I do. But I do like that people are trying nutty things. Well, look, I mean, here's the reality. Uh, there are a lot of people that are single through this pandemic that found themselves like very cooped up very quickly. Um, there's a lot of like wondering, well, in a world where now I am more remote, who knows exactly how long this remote kind of thing lasts? Who knows if it ever will end? 
or you're you're at a job that now you're setting a lot more of your own hours on. Um, if that's the case, and you're an outdoorsy person, and you would like to functionally own a a sprinter van uh, without actually owning a sprinter van, this is kind of like an all-in-one lifestyle kit for a very specific personality. Well, and and uh, keep in mind also that we are 20 minutes away from 5G being rolled out. We are 20 minutes away from Starlink being available all over the world. Like, like the only thing, the only resource that I could think of that is truly a, a pain in the butt to, to, to get anywhere would be internet. And that's about to be solved. In, in, I mean, in, it's solved now. Yeah. Like you, everybody can tether their phone to their laptop and and we're we're pretty much out of the the era of that being something that was like controversial or costly um you know so i think if you are if you are willing to live this life this is a lifestyle decision but in my mind it doesn't necessarily look any different than lifestyle memberships for stuff in cities where it was like oh like now you can be a part of our little club and we'll have events and and the things that you want to be cool have a experience that not everybody has connect with people that are like you that's what they're selling uh and and this maybe I mean, maybe maybe that's I, I, I beneath would, I, the surface i would not be shocked i would not be shocked if if they charge more i i can't imagine them making a ton of money on kidding out a bunch of sprinter vans for you know 1500 a a, a month but maybe uh it also occurs to me that this is a not not just a lifestyle that you're buying into, but a set of like-minded people who want to live uh -huh. a certain lifestyle, yep. i.e. 20-year-olds who are looking to hook up. Uh, and well, uh, like uh, I mean that that that's that's why we bought uh, the house in the neighborhood that we did because we knew it was a new development that was going to have fiber. And what we wanted was to be surrounded by a bunch of young 30 something attractive, attractive 20 year olds who want to make out. <laughs> yeah, young 30 somethings who were going to have kids all growing up in the same cohort. Uh, so, yeah, if you go read the website, they talk about adventurous, like minded, you know, willing yeah. to swing from one point of view to another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, I mean, those people who are rocking. Well, you know, look, I, I think that uh, if you were to draw a circle of people that would be very, very excited to live in a sprinter van and um, polyamorous couples, it would probably be a significant overlap here in the Bay Area. But, uh, you know, I, I do think that it's also it, it's 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 a, a crunchier lifestyle like that's that's the it really is like it's outdoor centric. And I'll, I'll tell you what, man, these sprinter vans are currency. People love them, and if you have them, they are they are their own in their own way, signaling to a different element of society. It is like owning a fancy car. It is like owning a Tesla. It is yeah. like owning uh, a, a BMW. You know, back or in the day, or a, a Jaguar. Jeep. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, Jeep signals probably to that uh, to some of the same people, but uh, a Sprinter van is like that tiny home lifestyle that we could be out on the road and. You know, hell, John Teasdale uh, was out here working remote for his job and has one of those things and just decided to peace out and drive back to Vermont. And he had the ability to do so because he's got a van and doesn't have to worry about stopping at hotels or anything. Yeah. Wave of the future, just like 1970s, which yep. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the comeback of all those movies about van life. You know, go yeah. take a deep dive on Amazon Prime, type in van, and you'll see like there was like like a three year <laughs> window of just, you know, van culture just exploded. <laughs> Gentlemen, let's do some picks. Uh, here, I'll do mine. It's boring because I keep picking the same thing, but it's the only thing we're watching. It's The Expanse. Uh, we were talking before the show about pr shows that take time jumps. Battlestar Galactica, obviously was uh, uh, one of them, uh, The Expanse certainly sharing some of the DNA of, uh, of, 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 uh, of or Battlestar Galactica and, and The Expanse are kind of in similar things, but we are in the third season now and there is a big uh, you know, time jump in the middle of it that I was very happy about. 
but I'm not sure I'm in love with kind of where we've landed, at least right now, but I'll, I'll keep powering through. So, so you're how far in? We are about halfway through the third season. Did you, uh, did, uh, last time we talked about it, uh, our, our noir detective was not your favorite character. How are you feeling about that character now? Uh, he has returned to a position of being not my favorite character. <laughs> he, he got he got into a he got into a, a good a, a, an interesting place, okay. and then uh, you know with yeah yep, for yep, for reasons yeah <laughs> returned to not being my favorite. Character. <laughs> um, so we finished uh, Last of Us Part Two. Uh, played the whole game through with my twelve year old. Uh, it's a mature title. Um, uh, you see some legitimately awful things. Um, uh, I, I, I loved it and I understand anybody who didn't love it. Um, because it is a very difficult play. It's the, you know, kind of the empire strikes back of, of what I assume will be a trilogy. But, uh, but if you'll remember the empire strikes back, part of what made it great was that it was painful. Um, it's a very painful game to play. Uh, although ultimately, and this is a full on spoiler, Justin, uh, the, the <laughs> message of the game is that, um, uh, vengeance is a never ending cycle and, uh, nobody ever stops. N nothing good comes of it. And it's a circle that you watch happen and it forces you to experience various parts of the circle and all of them are unsatisfying and empty and make you feel awful about yourself. And that's the point. And then there's one brief point when as one character, because you play multiple characters, you get to be the one to decide to break the cycle. And, uh, and you also get to live with the, the choices that you made along the way. It's uh, it's, 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 it's great. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, uh, also a video game, not as uh, heavy as The Last of Us, but uh, I started playing uh, when it came out on Friday, Ghost of Tsushima, the new uh, open world samurai game from Sucker Punch. Uh, it's interesting. It takes place in a, a, it's a fictionalized war account of, uh, of a Mongol invasion uh, in the 12th century Japan on the, the southern island of Tsushima. Uh, and you play as uh, one of the last remaining samurai after the Mongols come and and run run town. So uh, it's kind of like the Assassin's Creed games where you run around liberating uh, different parts of the island and you're upgrading and learning skills and getting technique points. And uh, it's 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 really cool. I mean, it's 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 really gorgeous. It has a very striking design like there's you know, there's. Uh, uh, falling leaves everywhere all the time, big weather effects, um, and and like the gameplay is is pretty good. Um, I I don't love Assassin's Creed specifically, but I do like open world games that have kind of a lot of different things to explore and to do. Um, which Sucker Punch, who makes this, they made um, Infamous previously, which is also has a ton of that, and and I I think it's I think it holds up really well. The story is like pretty is pretty good in, ter in terms of telling you a like a war story um and and um about the conflict right like the the main character has all this conflict of of how do you how, how what is the best way to fight the mongols right if you're a samurai at the time what you do is you go up to someone and then you fight them and then the weaker person loses and or dies uh where part of of the story that this is <laughs> that, telling yeah that ain't how mongols roll <laughs> right and so part of this is saying well Jin, what if you used stealth and thievery and and sneak you know sneaky moves um and how does that affect you given that all of samurai before this says nah man you just go and you fight and the the, the weak loses um, and so I think it, I think it does an interesting job of telling that. Uh, I I really dig it. We played it on Friday, on the Friday Night Bright stream. We'll probably play it more this coming Friday. Uh, yeah. Uh, of did, did you ever play any of the Far Cry games? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, which uh, 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 did you see that trailer for Far Cry Six? 
I I did. Uh, Giancarlo Esposito playing yeah. the bad guy uh, yeah. in a South American or uh, Central I mean, like, American uh, country. Let's, let's call it what it is. It's Venezuela. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Uh, he, he that trailer and the story that they told in that trailer looks very good. I would yeah. like to see what that game looks like. Yeah, uh, I but, mean, and 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 man, those cinematics are so good. Like, literally, couldn't tell at times whether or not this was computer generated or just straight up. They hired Sean <laughs> Carlo Esposito. It was amazing. Yeah, his capture was really good, and of course, he's he's got that like really menacing tone, and and does the thing that Far Cry games have done the past few games, which is like, hey, the villain kind of is interesting, and like he makes a uh, he, he certainly you certainly see his perspective as a dictator of a country that is over, undergoing a an anti fascist revolution, um, but like. Recent Far Cry games. I wonder if that has anything else to say about it other than I mean, interesting I, I, thought, huh? I, I hope it's good. Uh, but but really, it was, it was like Far Cry Three forward was when they figured out that oh wait, the villains are the stars of the show, uh, sure. not not whoever the main character is. Yeah, but also it doesn't like Far Cry Five specifically, which is all about like cult, uh, like a cult, like a bad cult. They enslave people and kill people and and all that stuff. They really don't care about like dealing with that at all anyway that's a longer conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, uh ghost of tsushima i'm really enjoying on the playstation 4 uh, i have a story i uh i messed up i screwed up something uh -oh. i was supposed to send what like two thousand i was supposed to send two thousand this is legit i was supposed to send two thousand books to somebody who's doing this promotion and i was, I was giving to them at cost and uh they gave me the address like the here's the address have them shipped to this warehouse like as a service sort of place when I went to go ship them, I pulled the address that was in all of their other emails. Like, this is like their Sigline address there. Because I'm like, oh, I got to ship. Oh, there's the address I see all the time. So I shipped it to that address. And then I get this email last week. Like, hey, I just want an update on the books. I'm like, oh, they're going great. I'm like, and you shipped them to the address I specified. And I'm like, what? Whoopsie daisy. Nope, I did not. And then, I, and then I'm like, yeah, no, we're not at that other address. And I'm like. Okay, well, that's a perfectly normal thing to put an address you no longer have any connection to, you know, in your email. But it's my fault because they did, they gave me the right address. I just wasn't paying attention. 2,000 so books. Those are, uh, those are practically free, right? Uh, so, so <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm having the, they're, they're being shipped to like, like they were supposed to go to, like Plano, Texas, and these were shipped to Dallas, which is not a terribly far apart from there. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the Metroplex. Yeah, but it's, it's a distance in this, and I can't tell the person. So I, uh, I'm i like, what do I do? And I'm, I'm panicked, like calling, trying to reach people that I know in, you know in that area. And I'm like, oh, we're about to go on a trip. Oh, we're going over here. Like, oh, maybe here. And I'm like, all right, let's think this through. I just need somebody to get it from point A to point B. What do I do? Task rabbit. And I end up, go to TaskRabbit, say, I need to have somebody show up here. You know, I send an email to the other place like, hey, there was a whoopsie. These things are going to be there. I'm going to have somebody come there. As soon as they're dropped off, they're going to come pick them up and take them to the other location. So the problem was Amazon split what was one order into like seven, like five or six different deliveries. Oh, Jesus. Which, oh, it was, it was a logistical pain. But what I did is I wrote up once, here's the task. Go here, get all of the cartons of books that have this name on it. You know, they'll have a reception. It'll be stacked there and you'll see an angry receptionist going, why are these going here? But just pick them up and then take them to this other location. So I had to do the task like three times or so to finally just get them all. But, uh, and it cost me a couple hundred, you know, maybe it cost me like under $200 to get all of the shipments done. But for which I was willing to pay a lot more to, to fix this sort of thing. So basically I'm a, very big believer. It really helped me out a lot. I was able to get the books to where they're supposed to do, be able to do this remotely through another city. And it's, you know, it's sometimes you just don't think of what would I need to use it for. But then this was a case where I'm like, let me give it a shot. Let me try it here. We'd used it before. Like I've used it through friends and stuff for like TV production stuff to get things done. But here was a very critical situation and it was very helpful. I will, I will absolutely vouch for the fact that when you send something over to TaskRabbit, they own the problem. They they don't just yeah. like phone it in. Um, and I remember when uh, when I was given a 
air quotes, free set of armor from John Teasdale, I had a task rabbit guy. I'm like, task, figure out how to get this to me. Uh, and then uh, somehow the free set of armor ended up being uh, $850, $900. And, uh, and I'm like, whoa, that's, that's a lot of money. And then there's a pause. The guy says, it's a suit of armor, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like it was very clear that he had fully owned the task and was rabbiting to the best of his ability. Yeah. I would say that here's the way I would say you want to use it. Getting things from point A to B where they're doing that is good. When you're asking somebody who you don't know if their problem solved, if they're a person like, Oh yeah, $900 shipped. Like there are cheaper ways to ship things. You know, like if you're getting somebody who doesn't understand logistics and stuff and is walking into the post, you know, the postal store and saying, Oh, how much to ship this? And they're and like, I don't care. Some other idiot's paying for it. You're it's not a good situation. You want to be very, 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 very specific. Well, about and, stuff. And, and, and I will say, I will say legitimately, uh, once everything arrived, I was like, Oh yeah, no, I personally could maybe if I spent an entire day, have shaved a hundred or hundred and fifty dollars off of this for the way everything has to be packaged and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, I felt like the the price was fair. They they didn't the the guy was not phoning it in. He was really solving yeah. oh, a, cool. a very complicated problem of how to send a literal suit of armor across America. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's gonna be very tricky. So that's why I say like I, I I was very happy. Like again, think about like. Would your average friend understand how to solve the problem or, you know, there, would your average, your friend who's out of work a lot be able to figure out how to solve the problem? Yeah. And I think that that's, and so just be, yeah, if you're specific, I think if you're very specific, I've had, I know of other experiences where like Ikea like owns like TaskRabbit now. And I've, I've seen situations where they'll send somebody to go put together somebody's furniture and I don't know what the heck they're doing. You know, I've, I've heard of, you know, situations where like they put that stuff together wrong because it's just somebody on task. Oh, I can go do this. And they show up. And they mess up your furniture, but like, oh, it's, you know, the bed boards aren't done right, whatever. And then you go, your mattress collapses and it's like, task rabbit, you know? So <laughs> just be anything that's skill-based beyond like going from point A to point B, be careful. But point A to point B, save my butt. So good job, task. Gentlemen, uh, next week's episode will be four taskers doing a show. <laughs> to intermediary step. Uh, it's oh, been wow. Can we, can we try that as an experiment? <laughs> <laughs> Brian, we, we you just... know why, Brian, you know why you and I don't want to do this? Because we're afraid they'll be better than us. I, <laughs> I want to get four task rabbiters. <laughs>okay we're going like man that was a really good show like jeez <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, alrighty. Hey, good weird things, everybody. We're going to take a few minutes here and come back with after things. Yeah. BRB. Uh, uh, uh. Bryce, how you doing, man? Doing all right. Doing all right. Beating the heat and, uh, yeah. keeping, uh, keeping busy. Keeping busy. How about you? Are things, yeah. uh, uh, how's, I know that you, um, uh, are they are they do are they gonna try to do any more rallies? I know you were saying like if they do them, um, I will go. Um, uh, uh, the next thing I'm gonna travel to is the Republican convention in um in August. Got it. Uh, but uh, God knows what that'll be. Um, you know it it I gotta I I booked the hotel when <laughs> they first announced the the location change and uh you know now everything's such a moving target but um you know i'll be there for whatever crazy stuff and it also is going to double as a trip to see my uh my brother and you know th there is family and my mom and everything in orlando so mm -hmm. uh that'll be uh that'll be good in the meantime just uh cranking along Making sure we make the donuts every day. Yeah. Uh, but the streams are going good. Streams are good. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's like, you know, it's just such a weird time. I mean, for, for a billion different reasons. But, like, uh, so much is just not what it normally would be. 
yeah. like and and politically it's like you know i found myself talking for 20 minutes about kanye west again on the px3 extra and part of it's like that's the most interesting thing that's happening in politics right now like everything else is kind of like biden's playing a very conservative strategy mm -hmm. we know the news of what's happening with trump but there's not a ton of um you know the stuff that i'm good at the yeah. like x's and o's of politics so like you know kanye holding a bizarre uh presidential rally wherein he uh <laughs> says the line uh my dad wanted to abort me is uh that that rates i'm yeah. sorry <laughs> it's just way more interesting than everything else that's happening uh what do you think about um the the uh the daily briefings are coming back do you feel like there is uh, there's anything to mine out of that or is that just oh uh, no, no no i actually think so um i uh uh you know wednesday's episode of px3 i'm going to talk about um kind of my my thoughts on where i think the trump campaign has been deficient up till now and where i think they're going to change but the, one of the biggest things is them having more of a set i think the strategy from them before was let's the the base and the and persuadable voters want a president that is leading them out of coronavirus right and so take a very reopening economy like that like that kind of track um i don't know if the nation is there yet i think that what most of people are looking at are, are a new normal and i think that bringing back the the task force stuff is uh, a part of that strategically from my perspective i like it mostly because i think that dr fauci and dr burks are very competent uh science communicators where i think it gets frustrating is when they only do press availabilities and press availabilities you're always going to be you know dancing to the drum of what the questioner is asking you as opposed to having like a designated point in which it is just the science communication kind mm -hmm. of like leading the 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 dance of course you're always going to wind up getting and we'll see it again tomorrow the the crossfire of uh you know the issues of the day from the white house press corps but i do think that in general i like it when dr burks and dr fauci are kind of just talking mm. dead to camera and not in an interview on cnn or in an interview somewhere else where it's like they are going to be beholden to the 24-hour news cycle and it's always going to be like something about a thing that is getting buzz in the moment yeah uh but, do you need a break juice yeah i'm gonna use that right. uh i did see on um the official netflix youtube that uh netflix supposedly has got the the last dance now so I'm interested in checking that out. The last dance is what again? The Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. The the one that was uh, that you used to have to teleport to a different country to watch on Netflix. Uh, yes. Now, you no longer need to teleport. <laughs> um, but uh, so that that's cool. I might I might give that a. Check, check that out between the shows here. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, I, uh, I, I I watched everything except for the one. I gotta watch the one. You still haven't? Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's an it's, easier it's, episode this week, but okay. I still don't. One day is the day for you to watch that. But that's. Uh, yes. Oh. No, I should. I should. I should. Look, it's it's homework. It's homework that mm -hmm. I don't enjoy, and. Uh, and I understand it's my job. It's just challenging. Uh, so that'll be coming up. We'll have uh, Meryl Barr on Cord Killers uh, later this evening. Uh, before we do all that. So. Yeah. Any of you guys watch uh, Good Boys? Good Good Boys? Good, the, good fellas? The movie with the kids? Yeah, yeah. No, oh, that's on my watch list. On You're HBO. thinking of The Sandlot. Uh, it's, it's a pretty well done enduring kind of movie. I mean, some of my favorite stuff 
like I think Seth Rogen as a producer is really good at putting together really good talent. And, you know, this was uh, really sweet, really enjoyable. And, yeah, I, you know, it's raunchy, but it's plays on more than that. Yeah, I uh, uh, was interested to see that. I think I almost went to go see it in the theaters. Um, and then why well, didn't I? I almost went to go see that in the theaters, but now it's on HBO. Yeah. And it's it's very much, you know, it's like it's it's super bad with middle school kids, you know. But if yeah. you like super bad, you know, then highly recommend it. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's a there's a a, a a music scene in there that I thought was really good, like really, really well done kind of thing that just was like that just sort of set up. Like I just thought the way it worked was like I'm like, this is really cool. This is a, one of the most well done sort of you know things time passing set to music and singing sort of stuff i've seen mm -hmm. cool um all right so we'll do after things here in a minute everybody mm -hmm. everybody went yeah then we're good off. uh okay we're uh, back on for a uh, uh happy hour right indeed yeah so so now it's a race Uh, all right, well then, I'll count you in, Andrew, for After Things in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Brian Brushwood. Ahoy. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, that's me. Gentlemen, here's a conversation that I think might be interesting to have, and also probably some of our listeners might be curious to talk about. We all were involved, are involved to some degree in making, we make a living through making content. We make things that other people, yes. you know, and, and largely... You know, you know, scam stuff sells physical stuff, but I would say that for most, of, I think for all of us, the lion's share of what we do is we take things in our heads or we take things from other people's heads, we merge them together, and then we deliver them in some sort of format. And sometimes it's ad supported. Sometimes it's supported by people paying us through Patreon. Sometimes it's people paying for us doing things directly. What would you say to you know a clever you know twenty year old today? You meet a twenty year old who's filled with, "Hey, I want to do this. I could do this. I could do that." What what path would I take? You know what what path should I follow? Should I create? And and I think that these could be twenty year old versions of ourselves to say, for example, and to say, mm -hmm. "Okay, if if I met you now, what would I tell you to do?" And and I'll give you an example as let's say myself. If I met a twenty year old version of me, I've already done. I'd already been doing like cruise ships for a year. And so I've come off doing cruise ships and maybe I'm like, ah, I like it, but I don't really like it. But I like at that point, I'm like, I still like, I'm like, I still like magic. And I, you know, and you wouldn't be able to, I would tell you how much I love science and technology, but I wouldn't have had the discipline at that point to sit down to learn, you know, programming beyond, you know, the, the stuff I knew when I was a kid, you know? So I would want to do something in content. I would have wanted to do something in magic. And maybe I would still want to be a performer. 20-year-old version of me was probably really still set on, I want to be a performer. And then it would be, how would I do that in this world? And, you know, first step is I'd say, go look at what everybody's doing who wants to do that. Then look at what's really working. By working, making a living doing that. There are a lot of magicians on YouTube who are performing and doing stuff, but none of them are making money. You know, I've, I've known magicians who were having YouTube channels with lots of views and stuff, but it wasn't, that wasn't enough. And often people have that attitude, like, oh, I'll do these Instagram videos. I'll do these 10 second videos and do really cool stuff. I'm like, oh, I've got, you know, kind of, you know, I've got a hundred thousand people following or whatever, like cool, but where are you in 10 years? And that's, that's a big thing that I don't think, you know, a lot of, I would say a lot of younger content creators don't think about, and it might be because there's, Everything changes so fast, it's hard to have answers, but career building is problematic. But I guess, you know, my my goal to myself, like I would tell myself, like, figure out where the money is and go to there. And that might be, you know, being a, a channel or distributor and not just this talent. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have thoughts on this, but before I share them, I would love to hear Justin's take. Um... 
you know the the biggest thing that i would say to somebody uh who is 20 or myself at 20 if i'm in the modern world is you know and this might be age or it might be true uh the world is a lot more the content world is a lot more settled than it was when i was 20 so a lot of the thoughts that i had that in the moment seemed revolutionary like i don't want to get a job at a newspaper because i think that that's a bad system for me to spend prime years doing i, I want to start doing um independent content and i want to make sure that uh i build my own audience and and they are are you know they know that i'm the one who's doing it and i'm not part of a larger machine um those were scary because you didn't know uh the only thing that i would say is that there was probably room in the middle there was room while i was in new york to get involved in some of the emerging like blog companies and stuff like that and i probably would have gotten uh, a, a little bit more into some of the systems and made connections that kind of could have taken things even faster uh than what i did but in general the biggest lesson that i would say is you know at the end of the day you have to follow what you want to do uh or else you're going to kind of constantly be rebooting like uh you and and if you don't like your content if you don't like your journey if you don't like your challenges uh then you're you're, you're not going to get the most fulfilling and rewarding elements of what an independent content creator's life would be at least that's in I, my and opinion well, and i wanted to add on it too and i guess that's kind of like to figure out how to what the advice to give like in the chat room, I brought up Magic, and somebody said, oh, going on AGT or Fool Us if that's your aim. I've been in Magic my entire life, and if I were telling a 20-year-old version of me, that would be the last thing I'd tell you to do. I'd say, stay as far away from there as possible because, you know, if you want to do it for fun, that's cool. But if you're a young 20-year-old looking to build a career, worst, worst use of your time and effort, particularly AGT, worst use of your time and effort to do that because – Nobody remembers who placed three years ago, four years ago, and you're no longer special. And there's you're 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 all of a sudden you're saying I'm going to compete in the same marathon everybody else is competing. And I think when it comes to anything, you need to carve out that niche that is you and it's different because otherwise, immediately you get lumped in with everything else. Yeah, and we can get into kind of more detail. I, about yeah, that I, I, on, I might but. disagree with you on that because what what you do get when you go on Fool Us or uh, America's Got Talent is you get um, essentially 30 minutes of studio rental time of a top tier, uh, production. And, um, uh, that means that from that day forward, your, your sizzle reel, your pitch reel will always instantly within three seconds of looking at it. Uh, anybody who's there to book the Christmas banquet or, uh, the Halloween special or whatever, will instantly know, well, at least I know this guy's not a total joker and I'm not going to be can, made to look you at can get that. You can get that in so many other ways without your scissor reel looking like every other performer's scissor reel now. That's my issue. It's like everybody tries to get on there, goes on there. You type in YouTube and every magician's, and I'm saying like, there are better ways. And you're immediately putting yourself in that category with those. And then now you're going to be competing for gigs with the guy who won AGT or the magician that placed higher and a lot of the most the most innovative talent in magic never goes very far in AGT because they want a very simple they want a very sort of thing. And so again, this is and it, everybody this is the difference of you've got a guy Brian who's built an empire related to entertainment and teaching people and magic and relating that. And I've got a very different approach to it too. So I'm saying like there ain't no one right path. And you know my because right. like my goal was I wanted to get on TV. And when I my first TV series, if I'd been on AGT, I wouldn't have gotten it. Because you'd be like, oh, you've already been on here. You've been played out. You've done this. You right. know? And when I went to Discovery Channel, if they're like, oh, you're still doing stuff. We saw you on this other CW show kind of thing. Ah, it wouldn't have happened. They wouldn't have taken me seriously. Right. And you right. Know, David Copperfield, and like I said, just let me finish. David Copperfield, like Doug Henning, you know, Penn and Teller, never did competitions. They never put themselves in a situation where they were compared to other people. Uh, yes. Also, uh, on the flip side of that, we, we live in an age where nobody sees, uh, the whole program. 
Uh, so what they see is the five minute curated uh, best of real uh, for everyone. And so if what you want to do is tell a story of, uh, uh, for me, the thinking was, uh, hey, you are looking to hire somebody for your freshman orientation. What you want to know is, uh, uh, is this guy going to make me look bad? Is this guy going to be a joker? Let me show you seven clips in rapid su succession that, that, that are instant proof that, well, at the very le least, this guy's made it around and <laughs> did. And yeah, they were low tier mm -hmm. mid uh, uh, daytime shows like, you know, Jenny Jones or uh, Ricky Lake or, or, you know, a couple of Tonight Show appearances and all that. But in three minutes, you could look and say, I know for a fact that I will not be made a sucker by this person I'm, who I'm not, I'm not going to be embarrassed. Exactly. Not, like this yeah, is, this I, is a decision I, I that will, the, uh, that will pay off for me. Yeah. Right. If your goal is to be a mid-level college performer, hundred percent, you know, right. but like the example we're getting here, like, Oh, it worked for Matt Franco and Shin Lim. And yes. And my point was for the amount of re effort you put in there, the thousands of magicians and the hundreds of really highly talented people there, you know, what, a, what a Shin Lim and Matt Franco both have in common. Uh, Five extremely talented. Yes. Uh, 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 well, I mean, I mean, just uh, uh, that's the uh, an identical sizzle reel. <laughs> that's what they well, have. They're young. They're young and good looking. They're yeah. young and they fit a model that that like. And Piff had a great character for him. You know, Piff, you know, did was Piff, so Piff would be, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I think that's and, the, to me the 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 lesson is if the person who's made the most of both those shows and even uh, fool us in the British version was Piff, and he did that because his character was ready for big airtime. Like, he had such a great character, and he maximized that airtime. That was just oxygen for a fire that has continued to kind of uh, continue to to grow. Um, but, like, I don't know. And, and I don't want to get into, like, personal, like, you know, different acts or whatever, but I do think that Andrew's, like, larger meta point of like hey look if you want to be the biggest and that's something that, that probably went unsaid in your initial like speaking to your former self andrew was that you had you know if you wanted to be a performer you wanted to be david copperfield level you wanted to be penn and teller level you wanted to be steve martin level and the question then becomes okay well how how do you get there what's the best way to use what are the best avenues to to chase down so you are at that like cut above level in a way that AGT is a lot of same, same, not only for magic, but for singing and acrobatics and escape artistry and everything else. And the, the challenge with AGT can be, you could be a guy that innovated, created a new trick, created a thing like this. And if somebody came, went on there three seasons ago and did a version of what you created, three seasons later, you come in there, they don't give you any credit for that. They call you an imitator. And that's one of the things I saw happen too, is some of the people who went really far on that show Oof, yeah. were some of the biggest copycats of, but they were young, they're really young and good looking people. And that's who the judges want to go forward because they know who's watches. And that's a thing where it was frustrating, like behind the scenes talking, Oh, I'm going to go do the show. I'm going to go do this. And you're kind of like, eh, like you kill it in everywhere you go, but this show is going to put forth a certain kind of person and not another. And also if they had a guy last year who did the same sort of thing, they ain't gonna let a guy this year do that. And you and know? I think so. I think that there's a would would you consider it a fair way to 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 restate it as um, if you grab the brass ring uh, of of America's Got Talent or Fool Us, then you almost certainly don't get to grab the gold ring of uh, a season of your own show. Uh, at least I, it, not in that order, because I did it in I, reverse order. <laughs> like I, I had yeah, a show and decided to, I don't know, yeah, I'll do Penitelli's Fool Us. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I, what I guess part of the thing that I get, it may, and it, and it, it, things may be different and stuff, but I would say that what I do know is that when you look at the amount of time and money that people spend, magicians in particular, try to spend to try to get into those third and fourth those rounds. It's like we would get just like we get these calls all the time, like, oh, I did oh, yeah. the th second round. And like, and I used all my great stuff to get past the audition stage. What do I do? I've got, I've got, I've got $15,000 on my credit card that I can spend. I need something fast. And that's, that's hard about magic. It's not like music where you can learn a new song and you can just pick stuff up. 
Um, and I'd say, if you're a musician, I'd say it'd be different. I'd say, like, oh, if you can make it pretty far in AGT, I don't think it's, other than the fact the contract's going to be on, onerous, whatever, but like, that's a different thing because if they don't want, if they don't pick you up, you pick up, start a SoundCloud account and keep creating cool stuff. People don't care, you know? What, so, so maybe, maybe uh, to back away a little bit, um, the big message is know what you want out of whatever it is yes. you're doing. Yes. No, yes. No, yes. what, like, like, like to yep. what end? Like uh, I, a bunch of people tell me, uh, 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 oh, well, I want a, I want a Hollywood agent. And I said, why? And, uh, and he said, well, because then he could get me the big gigs. And it's like, and then I say, why? He's like, well, then I'll have a TV show and that'll be a lot of people seeing me. And I'm like, so, uh, then what? And then he's like, well, isn't that how it works? And it's like, no, because eventually you're <laughs> working the chuckle hut uh, at the end of it. And you have a little uh, plot it on your on your handout saying he he was remember that show from five years ago. Uh, instead, Wait, Brian, who, who's booking who's booking the chuckle hut right now? OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so likewise, uh, 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 the. The. Um, you know, for me, the destination was uh, I want to be able to book up the majority of my year with 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 college uh, uh, gigs. And and the price to get there was uh, instant legitimacy so that it would that that everybody who booked would never be made to feel like a sucker. Uh, and, and so the way to get that was to do a bunch of TV stuff. So so I did the TV dance and I don't regret it. And I think it was great. Uh, but. Uh, it wasn't doing the TV appearances that got me a goddamn thing uh, above working the college market. It was the being successful in the college market that allowed me to build uh, to build a platform with Scam School. And when Scam School was uh, reaching out and building our own platform, our own crowd, our own people. And we were famous on our own rights because we were doing something that nobody else was doing in all of magic. That is what got uh, uh, the, the phones to get answered when we pitched uh, uh, what was originally pitched as the secret knowledge of Brian Brushwood and eventually became hacking the system. Um, and, and, yeah. And I think that's a great, it's a great point to the distinction because I think like, you know, like Brian, Brian didn't have anywhere near the emotional issues that I have, hard to believe. And so for Brian, who's like, you know, was working at your, you started your guy working a desk job, who's like, I want to, I want to engage my performer side. I really want, I'm going to be more happy performing. And, and you're willing, you know, you've done street performing all this. And so you're willing to like the idea of being doing college and stuff to you was like, that's great. That, that, that to be working professional doing that. And then when you did it, you're like, okay, the landscape has changed. The environment has changed. I have a knowledge set. How can I turn this into content where it doesn't involve me packing everything into a pickup truck and going from point A to point B? And I think that's really the cleverness is to be able to say, I have this knowledge. People aren't paying to watch magic shows on YouTube. You know, people aren't paying to watch magicians perform on YouTube. And, and magic gets to be, after a while, you know, repetitious. And you're like, well, what's the value there? I'm like, a lot of people want to learn this, want to learn how to do this. And that's where there's a value. Would you say that's correct? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, a hundred percent. And, and it's difficult to, um, uh, it's, it's difficult to give any simple advice in a world where everybody has different end games and everybody mm -hmm. is drawn to different aspects. I, for the longest time, uh, for me, it was the idea of, of a thousand people clapping for me was, was just pure ecstasy. It was just like, I couldn't believe that that was a thing that's, that's happened. And, and then, you know, as you start popping out kids and you realize like, oh wait, there's a reason people work for money. Uh, and because, uh, money is more fungible than claps. Uh, and so, uh, and so it, it shifted kind of how I viewed platforms and, uh, reaching, uh, a, a lot of people. So I, I would say going back in time, if I'm talking to 20 year old Brian, uh, luckily there was, a, there are three conversations to have. One of them I actually was lucky enough to have with myself with, which was at the age of 21, what is it already too late for me to do? Uh, it's too late for me to be the world's best violinist. It's too late for me to be the world's best gymnast. 
It's probably too late for me to be the world's best uh, uh, actor. Uh, but magic, all the best magicians I could think of seemed ancient and old. And, and I realized, well, I might have time to be the world's best magician, right? And of course, you know, over the last uh, 20 years, uh, 25 years, uh, goals change or whatever. Um, but along the way, uh, the second conversation is, what is nobody doing that you are willing to do? What is the unmet need in the universe that you can fill that nobody else happens to be doing at the moment? And, and for me, that was when I had the scam school realization that nobody was doing top quality, high definition, well-produced TV level uh, tutorials, uh, uh, teaching fundamentals of magic in a, in a in the field uh, bar environment, right? And then, uh, and then the third question is, uh, to what point? Why are you doing this? What, is this a bridge to something else? Is it, is it just for the money? Are, are, are you getting ready to turn this into a career uh, 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 hosting openings at used car dealerships? Uh, uh, have that answer. And if you can answer those three things of, of what can you do? What is it not too late for you to start? Uh, uh, what is nobody doing that you want to do? And to what end? That's all you need. Yeah, and I would say that, and to, to that point, too, is say that, like, when I was saying earlier, is like, look at where the money is being made. And that's one of the things that you said, okay, not specifically, not like, ah, oh, the magic tutorial market's hot right now. But you're like, no, but you're like, people tune in week after week to watch tutorials to learn how to do stuff. And then you're like, I've got unique knowledge that's battles tested. I've been on the road. I'm out there. I'm not some kid in my basement who's never performed, has no experience trying to tell the world how to be a master magician your legit experience kind of thing. And I think that was that was so much the strength is you came into that being, you're not a guy that's like, oh, I, I guess I'll teach magic on YouTube. What's your magic experience? Oh, I used to go to the magic shop. You know, you have this knowledge. And I think that's the critical thing is you said, tutorials, instructionals on YouTube are a way, to, way to, maybe not the way to fabulous wealth, but it is a viable means of providing and making money from content. Yeah. And, and luckily I happened to, at that point, uh, you know, what, 10, 15 years on the road, I, I knew a thing or two. So I felt, I felt reasonably qualified to step into that yeah. arena. Uh, and, and I, I, I wish I could act as though I knew what that would turn into. Uh, truth is I didn't, I just knew that nobody's doing this. There's an opening, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in this, this vacuum while it's still there. And then, and then we'll figure out what to do with it later. And when, and what we did with it later was, you know, build a freaking army and spin off, you know, four different verticals off of it, including a television show. It's in it's, you know, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the two things that I would say is, um, the idea of living purposefully, like just knowing where you want to go. And the biggest lesson that I would try to tell somebody or myself at the age of 20 is don't worry if when you get there or the further you get along that road, you don't necessarily love it. Like there's no penalty to adjusting. There's no penalty to figuring uh, something else out. The biggest North Star that you can figure is increasing your knowledge of uh, the landscape around you and how you make a living at it while understanding within yourself what you want to do and what makes you happy. And the more, to me, true success, uh, not only from a tactical perspective, but also from an emotional perspective, always comes the more that you have married that. And you really only know that if you are doing something on purpose. And now you know okay, if I want to do this, this is what this journey looks like. This is what this life looks like. And sometimes you love it and sometimes you don't. But every, <clears throat> every step forward is a lesson. You just have to know what direction you're going so you can remember whether you like it or not. You know, one of the, one of the things I would have told myself at 20 is that at 30, you're still going to be a young person. At 30, people are going to still look at you as somebody starting out. You know, yeah. and that's one of the things that was hard for me to get into my head because at 20, you're like, oh, when I hit 30 and then hit 30 and then it's like, oh, 
oh wow, people still think I'm on this. You know, I'm a starting out guy. I spent the last ten years worrying about getting stuff done, and that's true of forty, and it'll probably be true of fifty. Is that you'll look at like you know what like people of all ages get stuff done and people move into things and discover things and don't feel like, and I know we, I, I started this by saying, Oh, if you're 20 year old, but I'm like, even a version of yourself 10 years ago, and that version of yourself 10 years ago could be 50, could be 40, whatever, because like a lot can change. And, you know, I'll, I'll get into maybe in another episode, I'll talk about, you know, something I got into a few years ago that I said, I want to get into this space. And now I'm into this space over my head. Now um, these things happen when you say, I don't care. I'm not going to be looking at a calendar and judging myself by my birthdays. I'm going to be judging myself by what I'm accomplishing and what I'm learning to do and where I'm trying to move towards. So it is so much can happen. Uh, it is such a cliche. Uh, it, it, uh, there are very few trite cliches that I love uh, as deeply as this one. Uh, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. You know, like uh, yeah. it's, it's, and and uh, uh, the time is going to pass anyway. So uh, if if the time's going to pass anyway, then uh, might as well get started because current you is just uh, time traveled past you. You know. I have I go I get in a lot with like all friends who are talking about like oh, I have this idea for a story I want to write, and I'm like yeah just sit down I'm like just sit down write an outline and just give it a shot just just run out write until you find your limitation. And then understand what your limitation was and then start again. And then you'll find that, you know, I, I went from, I made a decision one day, I'm going to become a writer, a novelist, and I'd never written anything longer than 30,000 words. And a year later, I had written six novels. And that was just a 12 month span of just, what's that? I, I, I don't know that we've ever really discussed this, but um, uh, it was a very courageous thing for you to uh, read an article about how there's an emerging market of uh kindle bookstores and that people are making it in there uh and to have the audacity to just announce okay uh i know you know me as a cruise ship magician but i am now well, a nobody novelist. knew me as a cruise ship magician at that point but but but, but, but the but the point <laughs> is you know yeah you know yeah. me as a magic creator uh but you know what i am now a novelist and then uh you just started pumping out novels and and it wasn't uh, and uh, I I confessed I I didn't read the first few, uh, but then one day you're on the Audible store and I'm listening and I'm listening to you know a professional audiobook person telling me the story of Angel oh, Killers. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, and and I realized like in that gap where I if I say eye rolling that 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 would be rude, uh, uh, but but like sort of like. Uh, like, wow, that's very ambitious of my friend, you know, Andrew, to just decide to oh. become a, a novelist. Uh, and then, but then one day you, you, you read the book and you're like, this is, this is freaking great. He's really good. And then I'm hearing about TV movie option deals and stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 it did not happen overnight. Uh, and, and there was part of me. That was like, okay, I guess someone's a novelist now. Uh, it's 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 yeah. amazing. Uh, Brian, yes, that's we've heard that story before. Like, oh, I'm I'm gonna get, I'm gonna start writing books. I'm gonna, and like, and I and like, you know, I think the three of us, what we all have in common is we have the most angry, biting critics in our head you can imagine. You know, whatever the world can throw at us, we've got worse, and our 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 subconscious is telling us worse. And I knew that was a thing in the back of my head is like, well, everybody goes, well, I'm a novelist now. And I'm like, and I'm like, what happened? Someone says, oh, I'm writing a novel. I'm like, it's boring to say you're writing a novel. Like, what's better? I just finished a novel and I have a new one coming out. That's better. And, and I said, man, I don't want to be the guy that tells everybody, like I said, I had to, I go through this period. Like, I don't want to be a person who tells you what I'm going to do. I want to be telling you something. Oh, I did that. You know, I wanted to be the, in my rear view mirror because I'm doing something more awesome. And so my goal was, why is it I'm going to write a novel? I'm not like, all right. At that time, I'm like, no girlfriend, a lot of free time, you know, um, manic energy. I'm like, how do I avoid that? I'm like, I'm going to write my ass off. I'm just going to write nonstop and just keep going through every book, learn. Just I'm going to compress 10 years of experience into a year because I don't want to wait around. And I know everything in life, it gets better. You and we all got into podcasting around the same time. 
Brian and Justin are light years ahead of me as just simple performers because one, the talent, but two, the repetitions, the repetitions, getting in front of the microphones every single day. And if you choose something where you're not sitting down every day trying to make it better, not just going, yeah. hey, everybody look at me, but making it better, if you don't do that, it won't get better. And that's a problem with writers. I said, man, they write a book, they wait for people to, and you see this with big name authors who have a book, like somebody like a debut author has this great book come out and the second book sucks because they spent five years working on this. Then everybody told them how awesome it was. Then they sat down to the second one. I'm like, I guess the magic's in the fingertips. Are you right? And then it sucks. And you're like, I guess there's no magic in these fingertips. Uh, and now I got to yeah. figure something else out. To, uh, to, uh, to, uh, two things. Uh, uh, the second will be my, my pick for the, sh uh, the episode, which I think you'll like as well. Uh, uh, number one, for me, that moment was um, uh, the frustration of doing a failed uh, sizzle reel pilot uh, for True TV uh, uh, about a show about scams and, scams and cons where I, I trusted the experts and the experts None of them knew what they were doing, and uh, and and we got a very bland whatever. Uh, and uh, I, I I didn't it didn't sit well with me to uh, have that be a failure. So instead, I just announced, you know, what do I have? I've got a, a, a bunch of time on the road. I got a couple of three hundred dollar digital elf cameras. Uh, uh, there's this new platform called uh, podcasting. Uh, I have a show now. It's called Brian Brushwood on the Road. What is it? It's me driving and talking with my friend. Uh, but but to go from nothing to something mattered. And 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 when we later went to pitch, you know, scam school, it's because we had something to show. Uh, but second of mm -hmm. all, uh, uh, when you were talking about like uh, uh, Justin and I, uh, made me think of that great line from Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography, Total Recall, uh, which is my pick, uh, reps. It's all just reps. How do you develop the uh, Mr. Universe body? Reps. You look at the body and you figure out, oh, wait, these calves need to be a little bit bigger, and then you do reps. How do you act like a robot from the future who knows everything about how to assemble and disassemble a 9 millimeter pistol without even looking at it? Reps. You do it and do it and do it. How do you become governor? Uh, you give really bad speeches, figure out what you did wrong, and then give better speeches until finally you're able to correct and, and you know, uh, lean back and say, yeah, so anyway, uh, that's my Ill illegitimate son. Uh, it's, it's reps. It's all just reps. That's the difference between like, oh, I want a thing towards I want to earn a thing. Right. Yeah. And and what you realize is that the the pathway there is always within your own head. You always just need to to figure out where you are on the road and start walking. And uh, you know, for example, while Andrew has not had the same kind of flight time as Brian and I in podcasting, we've done this show for well over ten years. And when Andrew was thinking about those first few steps in writing. It was a novella that he knew we could plug that would be exciting to the weird things audience. Like, so like this was a place that was the <clears throat> sunshine and rain and soil that like helped nurture at a moment. It made, you know, there, there was a loop and then, you know, I did the, the, the teaser for it so we could sell it on the, on the show and that became its own thing. But like, uh, these are all, you don't realize where these things can come together, where these things can start feeding into each other unless, you know, like Andrew has not had a, you know, the same kind of burning desire that, that I have to be like a, 24 seven podcaster, but his ability to do it and his ability to, to create this show and uh, create the weird things idea and brand that was instrumental in the very beginning stages, those critical beginning stages of what has now become the dominant uh, uh, revenue generator for him in, in writing. So it's like, just even if it's not the thing you want to do forever, just, purposely walking toward a place and understanding the value of what you've learned is just that, that to me is, is the key to life. That is such, it is such a good point that it's like, 
you and we'll like I said a later episode I'll get into the, the what's going on now and how always having a thing to work towards that would build skills puts you into a very interesting position. I've had opportunities come up because I, I said, I'm interested in this. I have energy for this. I could spend, I could bench watch this Netflix series that's going to take up 20 hours, or I could go take a Udemy course and learn a skill and do this. Or you work towards a thing, and sometimes you find, a lot of times you sort of find like, all these random things just came together. You know, working, doing weird things with you guys gave me a platform when I wrote books to tell everybody, hey, everybody, I got a book, you know? And later things, you know, come from just don't be an idol. Make things happen. Like what Brian said, make things, make things, make things. Like that is yeah. just, it is, it's how you get hired. It's how you, that's how, that's what really smart people look for is what have you made? You know, and Brian got his, you know, his first, you know, deal I made this thing. And they looked at that and said, if this guy does this without our resources and our expertise, what'll happen when he has our resources and expertise? You know, it's, it's how I got a TV show, you know, is that. So. That's... Yeah. So you have a pick, that's, the, that's the solution. Just everyone go out and get TV shows. It's easy. <laughs> that's it. Well, oh, that's there, nice. there, there, but again, it's that they were the things they were the, they were the thing. I don't know. For me, it was, I don't know what to do. I'll aim for this. Yeah. Prior to my, and I, and I did several pilots. You did pilots for Cartoon Network, MTV that never went anywhere. And, but by the time I finally had my A&E TV series, I already had a publishing deal, you know, that was totally yeah. unrelated to it. And it was because along the way you pick up these skills and understanding what, what's commercial, what sells. And it's like, oh, you got the TV series. Oh, cool. You know, I got this thing going on doing writing books. Well, do you want to do the TV thing now? I'm like, I had to think about it. I had to think about it, you know? And then I'm like, stop thinking, do that thing because you're not going to, that's not going to come up again. But, but yeah, like you, you, yeah, the TV, TV was, that was the thing to do because I didn't have any other goals. And then once I got it, that wasn't the goal anymore. Right. Yeah. So, uh, 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 picks. Uh, yeah. Uh, man, I'm trying to think of like a motivational or, a, or, a a, a, a biography. Want me to go for it, what you think? Yeah, you go ahead. I'm going to tell you like one of the most motivational things I've seen and we've, I've, it's been a pick before. It is the behind the scenes of the making of a South Park episode. It's called Six Days to Air. Oh, so yeah. good. He's, so good. Yeah. You see Matt and Trey's brilliance. You see the strength. You see a relation to two clever guys, but you realize one guy is really the the hyper creative, but the other guy's like, I, you know, he can work around it and make things happen in the way they work together. And sometimes, sometimes being a partnership is like, you do your thing. I'm going to make sure the green room has, you know, has everything that we're going to want, or I'm going to be there when you need a sounding board, but I don't need to put my voice in everything because what you're doing is great. But when you're unsure of something, come to me, but you watch this, they make an entire South Park episode in six days, six days from concept to air. It's called six days to air. Cause six days before they're like, we need to do a show. And I think it illustrates too, like how lazy and fat a lot of production is. Well, and and, and, how, and we're uh, we're seeing a little bit about uh, in, in the world where kids, you know, aren't going to school, and we're figuring out that kids only do about ninety minutes of learning a day, and the rest of the time is just daycare and and PE or whatever. Like uh, I, I think in television production, this is a scathing indictment of like. Uh, yeah, you don't need that four month production schedule. Yeah, well, especially for animation, yeah. which is like triple, you know, the 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 time. Normally, it's like you know, we we used to joke uh, listening to the Harmontown podcast that his favorite thing to say whenever anybody asked him about when Rick and Morty was coming was they're drawing it. You know, there's there is like this famous kind of lead time there, uh, but not for South Park. They figured out a way to just churn these things out in, you know, oftentimes production wise, like 48 hours. It does. Yeah, and it, it, it's uh, uh, sorry uh, on, on the dynamic between those two. It, uh, I, I hadn't seen it at the time, but as I'm remembering six days to air, uh, it, it, it feels a lot like the Larry and Artie relationship where it's like uh, Larry needs Artie uh, Artie can't do the show without Larry, you know, and, uh, uh, but, but, but that, that support role, uh, that as a unit works. Yeah. Uh, the common air South Park has very little animation to it. True. 
just think of the writing, six days to have a broadcast script that is considering to this day, like South Park, like how many, what season are we in South Park? All of them. Uh, yeah, every, <laughs> yeah, like every season ever. I, I mean, that's, that's like, uh, let me see South Park. <laughs> and then I'm going to bring this up because I'm going to make this very uh, bad point. Season uh, 23 yeah. aired in 2019. My goodness. Yeah. Uh, South Park is like, you know, older than a lot of people entering the workforce today with college degrees and stuff. I mean, it's been there and it's still in my mind is, Oh, it's still that hip new thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. like that Benny Goodman album I love. Um, but, <laughs> but the writing is still 24 years later, a quarter of a century later, fresh writing. I say that's sort of the beauty of you watch six days to air. Just you watch this process to deliver just, and it makes me angry when you see crappy stuff. And then part of the things like I try to like, I, when I criticize stuff I hear, I try to bring up, there's a process, like somebody may have been brilliant and it went through the studio process. It went through like three months of notes and with everybody having the best intention, but at the end of it, it's may not be the best version of what could have been. Yeah. So. All right. Did, what about you, Justin? You, I, I didn't think of anything. Uh, uh, both of those two are great and you should watch, <laughs> uh, you should watch and listen to uh, uh, those because they're great picks. I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now. Justin's pick is the first season of Legion on FX on Hulu. <laughs> Legion. Loving it. Bryce? Uh, yeah, I don't really have anything in, in this vein of motivational stuff, but the six second days season okay. of Legion okay. on FX, uh, six, <laughs> six, six like, days I'm not really motivated <laughs> to pick a thing. Uh, uh six days to air is, is a good show. It's a good doc. Yeah. Right on. Uh, here's, here's something I will say. Here is my, my actual pick. Uh, I have very much fallen in love with my Apple watch over the past couple weeks because I've been getting into working out a little bit more. But like it as a being able to connect to the AirPods, like not being my phone places, like it has become a consistent part of my life in a way that I was not expecting it to. And it has not uh, uh, up until this point. And I'm, I'm actually thinking about getting a newer one, just if some of those features work even faster or better than they do on this model. But cool. I very much enjoyed my Apple Watch. Cool. Cool. I have two sitting in drawers now. <laughs> It watches. It just don't still still rocking the pebble time steel. Yeah. Pebbles, pebbles. There was a there's a really good uh YouTube show. I forget if it was Company Man or something like that, talk about the rise and fall of Pebble and kind of illustrating sort of the problems they had. I'll check that out. Um Yeah, it's worth it's worth because it's it's you know, and illustrate like what made it great, you know, but then what made it difficult and you know, but anyhow. Uh cool. So that is after things. Mm-hmm. It's been after. It's been after. Awesome. All right, we'll take a oh. short break, and we are back again with Happy Hour. Uh, there we go, everybody. Well, they'll be doing Happy Hour at 4 o'clock Central, so at the top of the hour. Uh, Cord Killer's coming up at uh, 6 Central. we got Meryl Barr as a guest. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Uh, I'm going to run out and, and try to get sad before Happy Hour by watching... Uh, I know this much is true. Okay. Uh, right. Check out Justin Streams. Check out Andrew Main on Twitter. Yeah, I'm going to probably just hop on and do a quick Periscope right now. So uh, before yeah. you cool. do your uh, party. Dude, yeah, check him out. Uh, probably Periscope.tv slash, slash Andrew Main would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Right, peace out. Okay. Sure. Bye, everybody. I